interested in aviation? How did I become into I've got early memories of flying in a de Havilland Rapide uh, from Ipswich when I was about five or six. I think that was probably the earliest memory I've got. Um, my father was a navigator in the war, uh, flew in coastal command on Lancaster's fortresses and things. So there was always a bit of interest in aircraft. Uh, in fact, my father used to be a preacher, a lay preacher in the church, and he used to give us balsam wood aeroplanes to play with to keep us quiet at the back of the church when he was uh, doing a sermon. So. Um, and we used to occasionally go to Edis, but I've got an, a memory of going to Honington and seeing two uh, bright, shiny white Victor tankers um, actually um, plugged in at about 500 feet across the airfield. Wouldn't be allowed these days. Uh, I remember that as part of the display and seeing the, um, the hunters in display, the black, uh, whatever they were called. Sorry, that's very even of me. I can't remember what they were called, but the big hunter display, I saw that. So yeah, I was always interested and uh, it was only later in life, because I didn't join early like a lot of people did. I was, I was 24 by the time I became interested. I just got bored with what I was doing and decided to spread my wings and go and try and do something else. So was this the reason you wanted to join the RAF? Uh, I think probably family history is one of the main parts of that. Father was in by that state. By the time I uh, went off to Biggin Hill, my elder brother had joined. He was a dental hygienist, and um, so I got to see a bit of what the Air Force was like. I visited him in Germany, uh, funnily enough, at uh, RAF Goodersloe, where I was going to be myself later on. Um, so we got to know a bit of the life and it seemed to be good and uh, Richard was very happy um, and um, so I went to Biggin Hill the first time when I was about 21 and they turned me down I didn't really find a reason why but uh, so I got my nose put out of joint a bit by that um, later on I thought I'd have another go and I thought what's the point of going to Biggin Hill again they'll only turn me down so I joined as an airman did a nine month direct entry fitters course to become an armourer, which was great fun. Um, got a bit bored with that as well, and went to see my boss with a general application for NCO aircrew. And he tore it up and threw it out the window. It was a summer, I do remember, and the window was wide open. It was a boiling hot summer's day. And I said, um, thanks very much, what's going on? And he said, I happen to know, he said, that you've been to Biggin Hill. And I said, yeah. And he said, so come back five minutes with another application for pilot. And I said, don't you think I should ask my wife? And he said, no, she'll only say no. So I filled in the application form and that was it. Um, and I applied again. And then um, I got a phone call from a young uh, SACW from Biggin Hill, an Irish SACW, lovely sounding young lady, who said, just to let you know, when you come to Biggin Hill in two weeks time, the BBC will be there making a documentary. Um, and we've been told to ring up people and make sure they're quite happy about what's going on. So I said, well, what, what are the choices and how is it going to affect me? And they said, well, uh, if you don't want to be filmed, you'll have to wait another six months. And since I was already over the age limit, I decided that it might be better just to be filmed and get on with it. So I did. And uh, that was the start of uh, something quite big, as you're, <laughs> as you're about to say. about uh, the fighter pilot series you were in. Yeah, well, the, the first thing I'll tell you was that, that uh, I arrived at Biggin Hill having had one phone call to say the BBC are filming. That was the total amount of knowledge I had about what was about to happen to me. The guys who weren't in the Air Force, the guys who come in from Sydney Street from university and things like that, uh, they all had letters and had been told about this thing and, and knew what was going on. So we, I, I right, then sat down and somebody said, uh, stood up to give us this little chat about what was happening and we started to hear about this documentary and then Colin Strong came in, the, uh, the producer with his jeans and his long hair and said, uh, told us about the program he intended to make. And this was kind of big time serious stuff. This, this, was, a, this was a peak viewing time BBC uh, originally planned, I think, as a 12 or 13 part documentary which was going to follow us, warts and all, they've been told, the Air Force would not be bothered about whatever we said or anything, it was warts and all. Um, Colin had worked on Sailor, 
which I'd seen and everybody had seen, and that was a good program. Everybody liked that, so we were quite um, impressed, I suppose. And um, it actually told that he actually told us the story that what they were going to do was they were going to film Biggin Hill. The people that got through Biggin Hill and were selected that week would then be followed through officer training, through flying training, and, and as they went through or didn't go through, as the case may be. Um, for the rest of the, the next something like two to three years, we would have this TV crew, camera crew, and Colin, you know, sat on our shoulders like parrots, everything we did. So uh, instantly I made a decision that, that, that was, well, not a decision, but I made a, you obviously, if you're going to be on television in three years' time, that was going to be about the time we would be on our first squadrons. Whatever we did, it was going to take three or four years to get to our first squadrons. So we were going to be looking like absolute idiots, depending on what we said, four years later. And, and being a little bit older than the rest and married, I decided that you had to, we had to be pretty careful about what we said. You could have opinions and you could say things, but nobody wants to look an idiot, especially on peak viewing time television. So um, we were careful and um, it went on. We, we, we were filmed at Biggin Hill. They, they didn't interfere at all. By the time we got to officer training, uh, I think most of us were quite used to having the cameras around. But as far as the staff, uh, the flight commanders and uh, the trainers, the, the drill instructors, and everything, they, they weren't as used to having the cameras around as we were. So we were actually the candidates, as I'll call us, the six, the chosen few. Uh, we're actually quite laid back about the whole thing because, oh, here's Colin and the boys with their cameras again. Whereas the people who were um, not being trained, who had a career in the Air Force, obviously had to be very careful and were not as relaxed about it as we were. Um, and it went on and there were some quite personal things uh, that they filmed. We were always told that if there was something they filmed that we didn't want shown, we had the final uh, cut if you like, we could always say, at any stage, Colin said, we could always say, I don't want that shown, take it out. Uh, I'll come on to that later, because I, I did have one uh, particular piece of film that I didn't want to check, um, wasn't embarrassing or anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. Um, so we went through officer training, um, then we went flying training. Colin was trained to fly solo as well, and there I was with Mike Jameson. Um, in the Jet Provost, um, Mike sent me solo and there was me with unique pictures because there was a camera on the Conan taking pictures of me on my first solo and uh, I don't know anybody who's got pictures like that of their own first solo in the world. Probably nowadays it's a lot easier with GoPros and things but in those days it was quite something. Um, and then people got chopped along the way and you know went off to do different things. And um, that was that was the program. The fun came eventually when it was shown in, in, in 1980. And as I predicted, and as I said earlier, you know, there we were on our first squadrons, about to be made mincemeat of by the uh, the people that were in the air. And uh, it happened to me. Um, if you want me to carry on, I'll tell you. the uh, I was on my first squadron, um, which was 30 squadron, the RAF liner, and I'd arrived there. Um, it must have been October time because the Oktoberfest was the event I'm going to tell you about. Now everybody else on the squad had been told to arrive at seven o'clock and I had been told that it started at half past seven. So my wife and I arrived and everybody had a couple of beers by this stage and we walked into the squadron building and were met with cheers of we love you Martin. Um, the wives were singing. I know it's, it's, it's actually impossible, really, to think this would happen now, but it, it was it was really quite something. And the only chairs left were down by um, a flight engineer called Terry Humes, who was the master of ceremonies that evening. And um, so we sat next to Terry, and Terry had a microphone in his hand as we walked in, and I was saying, you know, sorry, we're late. I hope we haven't held up the whole proceedings, and I was a bit embarrassed. There I was, flying off to Copart, first squadron, half an hour late for my first event forgot completely that the boss was a navigator, which is a bit of a clue to what comes next, because Terry said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to say welcome to uh, Flying Officer Martin Oxborough, who you've all seen on television, big cheer, ha ha, let's take the mickey, blah blah, that was, that, was all, that was all good fun. I'm sure Martin would like to say a few words, and handed me the microphone. And on the, this, this Oktoberfest was on a Thursday or a Friday night, and on the Wednesday night, when the programme was shown, 
Um, it was a sunny day. We were sat outside the hangar, and Colin had said, "Tell us about what it's like to be on this course with your mates being chopped and things." So there was young flying officer Martin Oxborough, or pilot officer then, sunglasses on, you know, looking like Tom Cruise, sat outside the hangar, and I said. Well, we all know we can be navigators in three or four days. You know, that's, that's what happens. If we get chopped, we go off to be navigators. Thought nothing more of that. How could that possibly be thrown back in my face? Those were factual references. So here I am with my first squadron. The wing commander is a navigator, and they're watching telly. And I've said, anybody can be a navigator in four days. Embarrassed? Slightly. So I thought, I'd better do something about this, because I got ribbed something rotten by the people on the squadron after the program show. So I said, ladies and gentlemen, before I say anything else, I want to make a formal apology to the boss and everybody, and all the navigators on the squadron, who, last night on television, um, I made a completely false statement, saying that we could all be navigators in three or four days. And I said, I have been back to RAF Finningley and checked, and uh, I found out that in some cases it can take five or six days. And I sat down and the boss's face was a picture. And I was banned from the navigator's office for about six months, I think they said, and uh, a huge cheer from all the pilots, but the navigators hated us. <laughs> and uh, so it catches up with you, that's the point really, that's, the, uh, that's a bit of a wordy way of saying it does catch up. So when and where did you start your C-130 training? C-130 training was, uh, was it 1980? It doesn't matter. It was 79 or 80. I think it was 80. RAF Line 242 OCU. Um, here's a big transport aeroplane. Here's six months of ground school. Nightmare. Um, and you suddenly begin to realise that this type of flying is slightly different to the other types of flying you've heard about and that other people are doing. Going off and flying in a fast jet pulling G, strapped to an ejector seat, on your own or with a navigator, um, for fairly short flight times, you know, a couple of hours. Unusually, if you were being refueled, you'd go longer than that to go on detachments and things and fly to Cyprus and stuff. But most of the time, they were flying hour and a half sorties. We were talking eight or nine hours to go across the Atlantic, and it was, the whole thing was really quite exciting. To someone like me, who, who I travelled a little bit, but I hadn't travelled around the world much, and uh, here we were, we were going to go to America, and uh, so we had to study MET, and not just MET like, you know, um, what's the weather like in the circuit today, or um, we're, going to, we're going to fly a two-hour Navex round East Anglia, what's the weather like, this, this, is, this is like crossing the Atlantic, um, jet streams, what the headwinds like, and, and you suddenly begin to realize this is a 65-ton aeroplane, right? Um, and you've got X amount of fuel, and if the headwinds are such and such, then you might have to think about the balance between how much freight you can carry and all that. I'm not making a big song and dance about it, but, but you know, it, 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 it's a lot more complicated than you think. Of course, we had specialists. We had a navigator with us, we had a co-pilot and a captain, an engineer and a loadmaster. Um, and they all had specific roles to perform, um, and we had to learn how that all worked together. And the training system, I have to say, was absolutely marvellous. It was, it was great. Um, we got crewed up together, so you, you stuck with a crew once you started flying. Um, I forget how many hours it took, but we went up on a first inverted commas solo, which was the five of you without any instructors at all. Uh, and that was like being let out of jail, really. Uh, here we are with a, you know, a, a huge transport aeroplane flying around uh, Wilkeshire, and uh, you know, we felt like God. Um, and then, of course, the, the, then there was the route training. Now, this was this was something else. This was this was uh, like you know four or five instructors with the crew, uh, and we flew. I seem to remember we did we did trips around Europe, to Germany, and uh, I think we did a Cyprus run or something like that. But the major one was the America trainer, and this was we flew to Ganda. It took something like eight odd hours to get there, and we landed. And of course, we went and had a beer, which is what we learned to do, and. Um, what struck me was, blimey, that's quite long the Atlantic, quite, you know, it's a long distance getting across the Atlantic. And I mean, okay, we weren't very fast, we didn't go very fast to the Hercules, but it's a long way. And somebody said, yeah, and if we go for nine hours tomorrow, we won't even get to the other side of America. Oh, nine hours? No, we're going to Calgary tomorrow and that'll take nine hours. Wow, this world's quite big, isn't it? <laughs> Stupid things you wish you hadn't said. But, um, 
it was really good fun. It was exciting and uh, yeah, some people would say it was boring, but you know, we got there and we would stay in four or five star hotels and uh, have a good time. Um, we'd have 14 odd hours off uh, in these places and uh, somebody gave us money to eat and, and drink and um, we had an absolute ball. Um, yeah, the flying was probably <laughs> pretty tedious. The, the uh, approaches in bad weather into places in Canada and, and other places, Norway for example, that can be pretty hairy. Uh, but the large majority of the flight is pretty tedious up at eight hours because you've got a nice autopilot to do it for you and lovely seats that you can recline and, and sleep in. Um, so all the fast jet people watching this are probably thinking how bloody boring is that? Uh, but it did become a bit exciting as we went later on because things like the Falklands War turned up in 1982, so we had to learn to refuel the aeroplane, uh, and the Hercules became a tanker, so we had to learn how to refuel other aeroplanes, and, uh, and we flew for even longer. Uh, I did 17 hours 40, I think was the longest I ever did, but some people went for 20 odd hours, 20, 23 hours. So yeah, it was fascinating, and 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 all sorts of flying I did. Um, you name it, we just about did it. The first squadron was 30 as a co-pilot, and as a co-pilot you started off as a D, what we called a DCAT, uh, and you were basically screened everywhere you went, which meant you probably went with a, another co senior co-pilot with you. Um, you spent about six months, as I recall, going around Europe doing trips to Germany, Cyprus, Norway in support of exercises, uh, Dechi, a place like that, Gibraltar perhaps. Um, delivering all sorts of stuff, in inverted commas. Um, and then you were let loose, you, uh, you got your sea cat and you started to go worldwide. Um, you know, the, the world was your lobster, as we used to say, and um, uh, America, Canada. I didn't ever get to Australia or New Zealand, unfortunately, but uh, got pretty close, got to Bali and Hong Kong and all these places that you imagine you'd never go, places that I couldn't afford to go now. I used to fly, people would pay me to do it. So uh, that was 30 Squadron, um, then I became a captain and I went across to 47, which was probably the most fun of all, if I'm honest. Um, 47, I've just arrived. Uh, 47 <laughs> used to do the uh, tactical low-level airdrop stuff, um, which was another aspect of the airplane that I hadn't come across as a co-pilot, so that was quite nice to get involved in that, do a bit of map reading and uh, dropping paratroopers and... Uh, dropping all sorts of stuff out of the back um, and being a captain. Being a captain was, was, was uh, pretty interesting. That was, that was uh, excellent fun, actually. Um, if anything ever went wrong, you found four people looking at you waiting to you know, make a decision or say something about what got wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, and of course, I became a captain in 84. And 84, 85 was when Ethiopia was on. So I went and did uh, the air land um, role in Ethiopia for about six weeks, I think we spent out there. And we would land on 3,000 foot long rough strips, 5,000 feet up in the mountains, delivering tins of biscuits and uh, all sorts of things. Um, excellent, excellent experience. Uh, and I did an airbridge as well as a captain, which was different to being a co-pilot because you actually had to get the probe in the basket yourself, and that's uh, slightly different. It's interesting to think that you can maneuver a 65-ton aeroplane within a couple of inches to get the probe in the basket, and uh, so that's that's quite exciting. Good fun. And then I did a ground tour in Germany because I wanted to go and spend some time in Germany with my wife and kids, and. Uh, it was probably a last ditch attempt to save my first marriage actually, um, but we won't talk at length about that. But uh, I had a fabulous time in the bunker. Uh, I'm leaning on one of Her Majesty's Harriers and I used to go and work in a tent and live in a tent at the Harrier Force, who uh, I considered to be uh, the Air Force's best pilots. I know they uh, love me for repeating that and a lot of people wouldn't like me to say it, but I've actually flown in a Harrier and these guys were something special. They were undoubtedly the cream of the cream. Um, and I was, felt very privileged and lucky to work with them and it was, again, it was good fun, sat in the back of a four-tonner, um, uh, sending tasks out to six airfields in the forest, watching the aeroplanes go off and do it and come back. Um, yeah, it was good fun. Uh, came back from there, 
and went to uh, 32 Squadron, um, which again I won't spend a lot of time talking about. Suffice to say that it didn't really work for me. I was a bit ambitious. I should have gone back to Hercules right away, really, if I'm honest. Um, there's a bit of a personality clash um, with the boss of the squadron. Um, what, all I'll say about that is we have just recently become Facebook friends. So everything is forgotten. It was a bit embarrassing for me. I found the aeroplane a bit claustrophobic and it was the start of my realization that there was something wrong. Um, and I was grounded and became an ops officer for the rest of that tour. Uh, eventually got back to flying, having been to Farnborough flying the Hawk and the Hunter with uh, uh, Colonel McCarthy from the USAF at Farnborough, and um, who I'm very grateful for to uh, and still in touch with. Um, Went back to line to do a tour on 24 and I won't go on at length about the mental illness thing unless you actually want to ask me questions about it but, and, and I'm delighted to answer them but all I'd say is uh, I didn't really finish that tour either. I was medically discharged in 97 because the problem came to a head and I had to do something about it. Uh, the C-130. Um, I'm told, well I seem to remember being told, that it's got similar flying characteristics to Spitfire in terms of numbers, in terms of speeds and, and, and that sort of thing. It's a beautiful aeroplane to fly. Um, most of the time you've got loads of power in hand, which is always handy. And of course, because it's turboprop and you've got very well pitched propellers, um, if you grab a handful of power, something happens immediately. And a little bit of lift comes in from somewhere. And, uh, you know, it'll bite back. It'll bite back badly. Um, I've lost friends over the years. Um, and, uh, which is sad, always, so I'll take a breath about that. But it's, um, it's got four engines. Why do you fly four in airplanes with four engines? Because they don't make any with six, somebody said. <laughs> which is, which is, uh, is um, one of the instructors at Lionel when I was there, who sadly departed now, uh, used to demonstrate a one-engine circuit. He'd have one engine feathered and uh, two others uh, back at idle and one engine on full power and would fly the whole circuit on one engine, empty of course with no freight, but it gives you an idea of just exactly how much power. And this is the C-130K, not the J, which has uh, had more power and everything else as well. Um, in terms of being a co-pilot, you, you were the kind of the meat in the sandwich of everybody's jokes and you soon learned to, uh, to uh, get used to the finger being pointed at you because you always made mistakes and you called, the, you know, I called up Greece. Uh, to speak to Athens and said hello squid because Calimera is the same as Calispera. I think I've got that right. I've probably got it wrong again. I don't care particularly. But um, and you'd say bonjour France and all this sort of stuff. And you, you, you'd try and be professional and everybody would take the mickey out of you. Um, or you'd ask for the weather from the wrong airfield. Oh, well, we've all done it. We've all been there. And eventually, you know, you got it all out of your system. And it was fine. Um, in terms of being a co-pilot, you sit in the right hand. In those days, you sat in the right hand seat. Throttles on. On the, in your left hand and the control form in your right hand. So when you became a captain you were faced with this because you sat on the other side of the airplane and you now have your right hand on the power and your left hand on the control column. But you start off with your left hand on the nose wheel steering and more often than not the first time you go to take off when the co-pilot says rotate your hand comes off the throttles and you'll suddenly realize that you've got your right hand on the control column, no hands on the power and your left hand is still on the nose wheel steering, so you end up sort of knitting your hands and trying to put them in the right place. That's normally in the simulator, I hear to it. Um, but um, yeah, it's a very comfy aeroplane. Performance is incredible. Uh, we were taken off at weights um, up to 175,000 pounds, which was about 30,000, 40,000 more than the normal uh, weight limit when the Falcons war was on. And um, yeah, you had to be a bit careful. Uh, you didn't have a lot of power, uh, excessive power in that situation, but it, but it flew very nicely. Um, I've been up to 41,000 feet in the aeroplane and it still flies up there, although it doesn't feel particularly comfortable up there, I hasten to add. But um, yeah, it's a lovely aeroplane to fly. It has a particularly nice oven um, and uh, the coffee and tea is excellent. And on the back of the flight deck is uh, our two bunks. So if you ever feel like you need a kit, you can always uh, leave the co-pilot to uh, take you to wherever you're going and, uh, and have a sleep. Do you have any memorable moments in the season? How long have you got, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> memorable fine. moments. Well, I do a memorable moment. There's things I can remember and, and there's things I don't want to remember particularly. Um, let me see. Uh, memorable moment. Uh, <laughs> 
not really, actually not really many scary moments. We were always taught, the, the things that flash in your mind, it's always taught, like in the simulator, when you get loads of emergencies thrown at you, the first thing to do is sit on your hands. Right, this is a bit like the story of the old bull and the young bull, where the, you know, the old bull and the young bull are at the top of the hill, and the young bull says, look down there, there's a field full of cows, let's go down and have one. And the old bull says, hang on, let's walk down and have them all. Uh, and it's very much a case of uh, counting, sort of, you know, most of the time I hate that. There are times when you need to react quickly, obviously, but most of the time, in an airplane like the Hercules, uh, if something goes wrong, the first thing you do is sit on your hands, just in case you should go and panic and shut down the wrong engine rather than the right one and that sort of thing. Um, and the drills we did in the simulator were very, very good. You practiced so many times flying around. I mean, you know, to be flying around on four engines was actually quite a privilege because most of the time you had three or even two when you were training the captain. Memorable moments, scary moments. There was a time in Ethiopia when I tried to get over the top of a mountain and uh, very nearly didn't, which the crew would probably remind me of if we were in a bar one day. Um, I used to hate turbulence. We, we, uh, the airplane wasn't allowed to be flown through CBs and uh, I, I had a particularly nasty incident in uh, a cumulonimbus cloud in America one night. Uh, when we felt as if we were going to end up upside down, but we didn't, and it was probably like me overreacting. Um, memorable moments, memorable moments. My worst memory ever, um, I have to say, without being morbid, was, was in the Falklands when uh, our good friends um, crashed uh, into uh, Mount Kent, and um, I had to make the radio call that they hadn't survived back to the tower in Stanley, and that was a pretty memorable moment that made us all sort of stop in our tracks and take a big deep breath and you uh, you know flying is fantastic flying is it's the greatest privilege of the world for someone to pay you to go flying whatever the airplane quite frankly and I had loads of fun and everybody had loads of fun flying but now and again something happens and you suddenly realize hey this is just a bit dangerous sometimes and uh, it bites back and you remember those moments more than anything else um, I lost my flight engineer, young Gary Nicholson, in the one the airplane that got shot down in Iraq. Um, those things are always very sad. I'll, I'll move on swiftly. He's, Gary will be remembered like the rest of the crew forever. Um, but those things happen. Uh, okay, the Falklands War. Um, I didn't get shot at. Um, my first visit to the Falklands was Christmas 1982 when the crew that I was on was sent down to stand in because a crew had gone down with the um, cold um, and it was a very interesting place to visit I've got to be careful what I say because I, I don't want to upset anybody um, I, w I spent four months down there in 1983 and we lived in what is now a prison ship called a coastal we were eight to a container. I gather the prisoners are not allowed to live more than one to a container, so it gives you a clue as to uh, what it was like. We were drinking out of paper cups. We had plastic cutlery, um, tins of beer, no glasses, um, which is sounds like I'm painting, trying to paint a rough picture. We didn't have that anywhere near as rough, of course, as the guys who actually yogged across the Falklands and won the war for us. Well done to them, and what a sad thing it was that we lost. 250 odd people um, fighting for the Falklands. The Falklands is beautiful. If it was 10 or 15 degrees warmer, there'd be a holiday in on every beach. Um, wildlife is incredible. And of course, it changed um, the aspect of flying for the Hercules fleet tremendously because previously, if we ever went to an officer's mess somewhere on a fast jet station, there'd be Hercules crews over there and fast jet crews over there and hardly would the two meet. Uh, we didn't have much to do with each other and there was obviously lots of banter between you know, the truckies and the fight. All of a sudden we were a tanker and we had fuel and the one thing that fast jet pilots appreciate is a bit more fuel so they can burn it off as quickly as possible and go and pull some more G because that's what they like to do. And um, so we became popular and also we were in the same bar in the same conditions on the same airfield for a long length of time so we got to know them and it was it was great from that point of view it, it, it pulled down all the barriers um, and we learned a lot about what they do and the conditions they fly in and they learned a lot about us um, fascinating time uh, the only 
although I wasn't involved in the war, the only sort of proper war, I suppose you could say, that I've, I've been involved in, it does make you think quite a lot about um, what are we fighting for. I don't want to go on about that. It, it's, um, it was an interesting experience. I, presume, I think I actually grew from the experience. Um, and it makes you think about lots of things. Um, but overall, um, yeah, interesting. Um, would I want to do it again? No, thank you. <laughs>
anybody who wants to talk to me or discuss this, by the way, um, I'm delighted for anybody to get in touch with me through Twitter, Facebook or whatever, because the more people talk about it, the better, because there is stigma about mental health and we should talk about it more and it should be treated better. In fact, it should be treated the same as physical health and it isn't. Um, I am still taking medications. I've been taking them since 1997. I have had all sorts of treatment, um, the vast majority of which hasn't worked. I've recently um, found um, that hypnotherapy seems to help me quite a lot and I would be happy to discuss that with anybody who wants to ask. But it is embarrassing. I did find at first that I was a bit isolated. Uh, nobody wanted to talk to the sickie in the corner on his own at the end of the bar. Uh, but after six months, everybody got used to it, and people used to come over and say, well, I felt like that myself, uh, you know. Um, and I think the important thing about the whole of this business is that it took a lot of balls to actually stand up and say, um, there's something wrong. And anybody who has the slightest hint that there is something wrong mentally needs to have those balls and needs to stand up and say it, because um, you're not doing yourself any good or anybody else any good by carrying on. So stand up and say something, get some treatment, talk to people, read the books, um, take the pills, and uh, you know, keep fighting. Um, it's tough. It's a tough old world out there, and there are plenty of people who want to knock you off your pedestal and take the mickey out of you. But um, I'm now, at the age of 63, quite happy to talk about it. Uh, it's debilitating. Um, and uh, very restrictive on your life but there are ways and means you can adjust your life which is what I've done and I've stopped talking about it now but there are ways and means of adjusting your life I've adjusted the whole of my lifestyle to avoid stress completely uh, I've got horses because they help with stress I don't drive the car as far as I used to because that's stressful so there are lots and lots of things you can do so you should never feel lost okay talk to me